What's going on guys? Welcome back to my personal channel. Welcome back to another video for you guys today. It's five things that we've learnt from Chelsea nil Liverpool 2 and in some cases it might have been a bit of a slap back to reality in a couple other cases it was expected and in the case of Liverpool I've been saying it for the last 12 hours now at this point Liverpool deserved to win that match they were the better team out of the two but the game was handed to them the victory was handed to them on the silver platter they took it and in the space of 10-15 minutes the game was won lost and finished and it wasn't going to change from then I'm going to go into these five points we're going to discuss some of the obvious points we're going to discuss some of the other little finer features of the game as well but before I start this video, if you guys haven't done so already, smash that like button, press that subscribe button as well because I don't want to see any red today, it's just one of those days. And please press the bell notification button as well to be the first guy to know whenever it's up to my mood if I manage to hit 15k today. So guys, please smash that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Right, let's go straight into the first point and I, I don't think there's anywhere else other to start than in goal. Let's talk about Kepa. Useless. Absolutely useless. And... It's jarring because we know Mendy's coming in, and I've said this in my review as well. If you know a goalie is coming in in literal days for your spot, and you perform like that, how are you expecting me to believe in you if you're not believing in yourself? And I said the same thing after that Liverpool game where we lost 5-3 and he cost us that one. But with Kepa, we knew he had about two, three games where he was going to play and he had to prove his position. Because if not, Mendy isn't going to come in to compete for his spot. Mendy is just going to come in and replace him. As soon, as soon as we went down to 10 men, I said all it's going to take for these bastards is just one shot and they're going to put into the net. First shot five minutes in, he couldn't reach it. Like, the first shot, I don't want to blame him too much for it. But if you look back at the replays, he looked so tiny reaching for that ball. And it just didn't look like he was going to reach that. And that's been a problem with us with Kepa for so long. It's that he can't even reach the corners. So what, what's he defending? Is he defending the middle of the goal and that's it? First off... I think Liverpool might have had one shot on target, but I don't remember them having anything clear-cut. He flapped at a couple corners, but other than that, it was a quiet first half for him. He didn't really have much to do. I'm not going to blame him for the Christensen red card either. It's not his fault. Christensen was a stupider one out of that. Kepa just came to release the ball. You can blame Kepa for a lot. I'm not blaming him for that one. That's not his fault. As soon as the first goal went in, though, the drop-in confidence, man, and... That stupid, stupid error for the second one. Like I, I don't know how to describe it. It's the sort of goal that you're not going to be allowed to forget about. It's going to be one of those goals that may just define Kepa's career. It's already going to define his Chelsea career because I think that's now in the mud. But it's, it's so stupid. I talk about game management. I talk about confidence. I talk about the way you manage games. Kepa was absolutely awful. First game, you've got to keep your heads up. What happens? You get the ball and you freeze. His distribution was meant to be a big part of the reasons why we did sign him. And yet again, it didn't show its hand again. That second goal, I, I don't really have the words to describe it because we have seen some bad mistakes from Kepa recently over the last season and a half. But not that, man. Not that, man. You know what the most jarring part was? He looked like he woke up after that second goal. Like... Thanks, mate. Like It's only a bit too late now for it. But he looked like he woke up, so I don't even know what to say about it. Because he caught his first corner in over a season after that match. And he actually made a save afterwards as well. So I'm still saying it was a terrible performance. But, bruv, why are we seeing like the good you once the game is done? Like, couldn't we have had this from the first minute onwards? And we might have had it with a little bit more confidence. And I wasn't just going to sit here thinking we're going to lose as, as soon as we go down to 10 men. First point, Kepa had another jarring performance. Get Mendy in as soon as possible. I'm hoping Ren didn't watch that match and try and fall back on the original deal that we had again, just like they did back on Monday after the Brighton match. But who knows? I wouldn't blame them for raising the asking price after this. It was a shocking performance from him. Second point I'm going to go into, and it's N'Golo Kante. And Kante was absolutely immense yesterday. His full return from injury might be more important to us than some of the new signings that we brought in. The amount of times that this guy popped out of nowhere with a tackle to break up play and to reduce the pressure on the defense was ridiculous and it looked like prime Kante was back again also want to say as well him on the ball he looked so good his dribbling his close control the guy was able to drag two or three Liverpool players with him every time he was on the ball which opened up space for other forwards and yeah Kante looked like he was back to his best again he had an amazing game against Brighton I think he made more interceptions than the entire Tottenham team did on that match day 
I don't know why people wanted to sell him. I've said this so long and I'm glad I've got a little bit of vindication on it now because, bruv, I told you, selling N'Golo Kante would be up there with selling De Bruyne as one of the dumbest decisions that we made over the last decade. The guy breaks up play like nobody else. I, the game I always reference back to, Bayern Munich in the first leg where we lost 3-0. Do you want to know why we got piped 3-0 and their midfield was just running rings around us for fun? It was because N'Golo Kante wasn't on the field breaking up play and trying to take the pressure away from our back line. We need a player like him in our starting lineup. And the reason why he looked so sloppy last season was because we rushed him back from injury too much. It's also kind of N'Golo Kante's thing as well. He's never going to say no. It's just his character. If you want to bring him in the starting lineup and he thinks he's fit, he's got that heart and that desire about him that he's never going to say no. That's also kind of the mentality that I want to see at Chelsea. But Kante did work to his detriment as well because he came back too many times when he wasn't fully fit and then just got himself re-injured and had to come back, come out again. And you saw how much we missed Kante when he was gone. I think after his last injury, we conceded 10 goals in our last five games to end last season. Now N'Golo Kante is back in the starting lineup. Now he's also a bit more accustomed to that lone DM role as well. I am very confident that we are going. We already look so much better in midfield. I'm going to go into that in my future points as well. But that was my second point. N'Golo Kante, thank God we didn't sell him. Third point I want to make, defensively compared to last season, we look like a completely new team and that's half the reason why I'm not I'm not angry at the way we played, I'm not angry, I'm kind of angry at the way the game came out, but it's because of the errors that I'm angry. The way we played, it, it's, it's, that's another reason why I'm angry because the way we played, we did so well. I genuinely think that second half performance could have gone either way. Yes, Liverpool dominated us. I will say that straight up. Liverpool had more of the ball. They had, I think, more of the chances as well. Overall, they dominated us. But I do feel we allowed it to happen as well. We didn't try to fight them man for man, try and fight them on the press and try and play them at their own game or anything like that. We know Liverpool are a much more better gelled side than us. We know as a team, right now, they're better than us because we're still missing a lot of injuries as well. So we weren't going to go out man for man and just attack them. We were going to sit deep a bit more. We were going to focus more on our defensive shape and we were going to try and hit them on the counter. And first off, I think before the Christensen red card, everything was going to plan for us. Yes, like I said, Liverpool had more of the ball, but they still didn't really do much. They never really broke through our defence. They never really had any clear chances on Kepa. One, I had a couple good chances coming off the left-hand side didn't get any on target fair play but you could see what we were trying to do and it was working and that's why I feel so annoyed about the way the game went out because for the first half everything was so flawless off the ball our defensive shape was excellent and you guys know from last season how badly our defensive organization was this looked like a completely different Chelsea I know we've got more background coaches that have come in from last season we got a new pressing coaching as well I still want to wait to see how that fully instills itself on the team but early signs are there man I'm really happy with the way the team played defensively in midfield I think Liverpool slightly won the midfield battle, but I do think it was a much more even battle than people give it credit for. I think Jorginho was good at beating the press, but his passing let him down. Kovacic, we already know what he's about on the press. He's like the best guy to, to have when you're playing against Liverpool. It's easy, it's light work for him. And then Golo Kante already spoke about how excellent he was. Going forward, might have been where we were let down the most, but we were focused more on our defensive mindset, so that was going to take a hit as a result of that. Mason Mount, I thought was decent on the press, but his end product lacked a little bit. Kai Havertz, Kai Havertz and Timo Werner, I'm going to delve into a little bit deeper, but I thought they were okay. I thought they were just okay, but defensively, we were brilliant off the ball. Individual performances as well, I thought were all excellent. Alonso got done a little bit, but we expected that for Alonso it was all going to be how he coped. And we knew with the Chilwell injury, we, were gonna, we weren't going to have our, our best centre-back playing anyway. So that just is what it is. Uh, Zuma, I thought was excellent. And when Thiago Silva comes, that's his partner right there. Christensen was, ugh, Christensen was so annoying because he had a good performance. He had, those, he had such a good performance for that red card. He showed that he was still the best tactical player on the field. His passes were amazing. He was all over the field. And then that stupid decision came for the red card and he just ruined it all for him. And I've said it on my review as well. 
I hope this isn't the type of player Christensen is just going to be now, where he has a couple, where he has a great performance and just ruins it for himself, because that's now setting a precedent. And it's annoying, but I will give him that he had a good performance before the red card. He just ruined it for the team and ruined it for himself. Zuma, I already said, was class. Reese James, I thought, handled himself very well against, uh, what's his name, Andy Robertson and Mane. Yeah, he did get beat for the first goal and it was a bit of a rookie error because he was following the defensive line and trying to stay offside instead of keeping on track with Mane. Bit of a rookie error, but overall I thought he had an amazing performance. So I'm not going to say too much about it. There's one mistake. And also down to 10 men, you know that these mistakes are going to happen, especially early into the game. I was more annoyed at the goalkeeper on that because he just couldn't reach it. But like I said, Reese James had a great performance as well. Defensively, we look like a completely new side and Thiago Silva hasn't even stepped foot in the team yet. That is why I am optimistic about the rest of the season. I don't want to hear any rival fans getting in my head saying, oh, two games in and you're already getting battered by Liverpool. It's Liverpool. It's Liverpool. They're like, they were going to be favourites going into this match anyway, so I'm not trying to hear it. Fourth point, and while we're on the case of talking about centre-backs, let's talk about Fikayo Tomori, because this guy made a great case for himself not to be loaned out. We brought him on at half-time, threw him at the deep end because we needed to stabilise our defence after the Christensen red card. And the guy came in and he was near flawless. Aerially, which was one of his biggest problems from last season, he was dominant. On the ball, dominant. Pushing the ball forward well. He was, his deep line playmaking skills were there for everyone to see. And with Rudiger being dropped out of the lineup for yet another Chelsea match, does it look like he's being preferred more? Initially, it does. I don't know if he's going to be loaned because I know Renz wanted him on loan as part of the deal, but I don't know if that's been confirmed as well. I know Everton wants him on loan as well. There's a string of Premier League clubs that are interested in him too. And I'm, at, I'm in two ways about it because on one hand, the ability for him to sit for a year and learn off Thiago Silva and play next to him could be invaluable experience to him. But same way, weekly experience at a Premier League club getting regular minutes might be more valuable experience to him. I don't know. I think we're in a very delicate place with Fikayo Tomori because same way, even alone is probably going to feel like a step back to him mentally. Last, season before last, he was loaned out to Derby. He was given a chance at Chelsea again and now we're loaning him out again. I wouldn't blame him for feeling a bit frustrated about it. But same way, it all depends on it has to be the right loan. I, even if it's a bit part loan just to get another player coming in the other way, it has to be the right one. West Ham, if they want him and we can bring Rice in the other way, yeah, I'd take that. Everton, I'd kind of take that as well. That, those are the only ones I'd leave. If not that, I would like to see Tomori stay at Chelsea. Even if Lampard lost confidence on him towards the end of last season, I still thought he was a quality centre-back and a lot better than centre-backs we were seeing from last season. So I'd like to see Tomori get given a good chance. If he goes out on loan, just please let it be to the right team. Final point, and we're going to talk about our new signings because I know our rival fans have had a lot of words to say about him. First off, I'm going to get the stat out there. Yes, it's been two games and Kai Havertz and Timo Werner still haven't had a shot on target. I don't care. I'm here to tell you no Chelsea fan cares. It's about the performance. Now, we know, especially after the amount of money that we spent on signings, we care about the overall performance. Timo Werner hasn't scored in two games, but he has had two good games. He's won penalties for two goals, and he's probably been our best attacker going forward out of everybody right now. So, nobody cares about no Timo Werner slander. Kai Havertz as well. That one is a bit more understandable because I get he hasn't had any moments as just shone out or as he hasn't had any vintage moments as Frank Lampard has said. But I still think he's looked promising. He hasn't ghosted any games. When he's been around, I think his first touch passing has been good. His movements into the box has been good. You just haven't seen anything like that yet. You haven't seen anything that's like, okay, yes, this is that generational talent that you're on about. But he hasn't done anything wrong. So... With Havertz as well, it, Havertz is one I will give the rival fans a little bit more than I'll give Werner. But Werner's looked absolutely amazing the last two games. The golfing class in him and any of the centre forwards that we had last season is clear there for everyone to see. Havertz will come good in time. It's a bit slow, but he will come good in time. Right now, he hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't look shaky on the ball. He hasn't lost the ball multiple times. Straight up, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's just going to bleed in a little bit slowly. It's a gelling process. That is why... I'm annoyed about this result, but we take it on the chin and we move on. But guys, this is the end of my five reasons why. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of the points I've made down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carefree Lewis June. I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Up the chills.